Hey babe, and anybody else watching, and welcome back to A Life Together. Today, 1 Corinthians 5 through 9. Yesterday, we were looking at Paul's thankfulness. We saw his uh, discussion about church divisions, and then also Christ as the wisdom and power of God. Now, today we're going to be looking at more of the interactions uh, between believers. We'll be looking at sexual immorality, at marriage, at food sacrificed to idols, and then also the rights of an apostle. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the church's uh, alignment and making sure that God's church is properly aligned. We'll talk about that really briefly. Uh, but again, today has us 1 Corinthians 5 through 9. So, chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who, is di who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, but the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Um, but now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, you are not competent to judge are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. It is, is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to the law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among, among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? 
whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Chapter 7. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but to her husband. In the same way, her husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprave each other, except by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift and another has that. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. If she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who is a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, he... Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called him to. Now, about virgins. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live, live as if they had none, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if it were not engrossed in them. For this world, in its present form, is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world and how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way and in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if she is getting along in years and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin is right, but he who does not marry, does not marry her does even better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Chapter 8. Now, about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. 
So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no god but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one god, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you, uh, sees you who have this knowledge eating an idol in an idol's temple, he won't won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols. So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Chapter 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers in Caiaphas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. It is about ox. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up anything rather than the hin to hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in hope that you do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have received, I have reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all, by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only, the, only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the, from the prize. I think that's a great reminder of the fervency with which we should be pursuing God and pursuing others and pursuing others that they may know God and pursuing God that we may be strengthened. Because if... If life is as exhausting as Paul has, and Paul has an extremely exhausting life, and many of us don't have that exhausting a life, but regardless, attacks will come. So it's important that with all fervor, we are pursuing Christ. And with all fervor, we are pursuing others 
that we may win them to Christ. So I think that's a great reminder. What else I thought was interesting is that idea of expelling the immoral brother and recognizing that, that we're not saying churches shouldn't welcome people who struggle with that. But the struggles that he's talking about with the, the immoral brother, I think it's in verse one or two, it is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you and a, of a kind that does not even occur among the pagans. A man has his father's wife. It is verse two. Verse two, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship this man who did this? They're proud, so there's no relenting there. There's no repentance. And so I think it's it's an important distinction that we recognize, yes, the God welcomes all and the church should welcome all, but we shouldn't stay as we are. We should be aligned to Christ. We should be changing to become more lifelike or more Christ-like in our lives. I think that's that's something that is really dangerous if that doesn't happen. Churches can just do what feels good. So we've accepted as many people as possible. I fill those church seats. Then we don't change. And instead we become like the world. And that's where that's really dangerous. So this idea of expelling the immoral brother really shows, hey, is someone in unrepentant sin? Sin they're not worried about at all. Doesn't bother them in the least bit. There's a big problem there. And I love that Paul calls that out. Really important, so let's pray about it. God, may we always be repentant for our folly. Lord, may we always seek out you and your will. And when we fail that, Lord, help us not to become so calloused or even a step further, Lord, proud in that sin. God, we thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy and surrounding us with brothers and sisters who will call us to account. Lord, for those of us who may not be in a church body, Lord, Help us to find a church body. For those of us that are, Lord, help us to uh, continue to be with our brothers and sisters and hold them to account. My God, again, I thank you for your love and grace to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that is about all I have for you today. As always, know that I appreciate you. Wife, appreciate you tons. I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.